So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to start my talk by th uh, saying thank you to the organizers for this opportunity and for you for being here a Saturday afternoon. So I think, <laughs> I think this is a, a really a, a very good opportunity for showcase what we are doing, our our day-to-day -day job, and how us as women, as part of the society, we are contributing with the with the growing of uh, Canada and the rest of the world. So my name is Carolina Vesega. I am the chief scientific officer and co-founder of Strady AI. Strady AI is a company Montreal-based that we provide solutions based on AI, based on what we build is product and services, and we use AI in daily basis. My main role in the organization is to help with the vision where these products are going to go, help business people to decide what kind of solutions are the, the most suitable for their own businesses, and at the same time, I manage a team of researchers that build this solution. And also, I, I'm not directly managing, but I also very, very involved with developers, web mobile, backend developers uh, that, that make this possible. Um, uh, as you can notice by my accent, this is the about me slide. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm, I come from Venezuela. It's a South American country with amazing beaches. We also have the highest waterfall in the world. That's Caracas, the city where I live all my life. And that's the longest cable car in the world. So Venezuela is an amazing country. I needed to come to Canada, not because of the beauty of the country, but because of people. <laughs> 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 and well, I, I'm very, very happy being here. And the thing I like the most about Canada, and this is one of the main topics of my talk, even if I'm going to put this in the context of artificial intelligence, is how inclusive and diverse is the society. I'm, I, I felt welcome in this country from day one. I felt that even if I didn't speak any English or French when I arrived, and I I really started in a very, very, very basic and low-level jobs. I, I was able to grow in my career only by being perseverant and never give up. So, and I think that, that that's, that's amazing. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, one thing that I'm, I'm very happy, and, and this is very, very interesting, because I, I have been working at a strategy uh, before we were a study AI, we were a software development company, and I have been working there for seven years, or almost eight years now. And I, I, I'm very involved in decision making, and we never, never have done anything in particular when we're hiring people to say, ah, let's, let's uh, fill this amount of women or this amount, uh, this amount of cultures. We have never done anything explicitly during the hiring process. We always try to, to get the, the, best, uh, the best fit for us. Best fit means that has the knowledge and also is nice. And it seems that when we're doing this, we're doing something good because right now we made some stats for the International Women's Day. We wrote an article, we did some stats. We have 43% female uh, when the average in Canada is 22%. So we are really in a good shape there. Uh, there are 12 different languages that we, that, it's not that we speak all of them inside the, co the company, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the people speak 12 different languages. We have 10 different ethnicities inside the company. So, and that diversity, and not only that this diversity, this is the, like the demographic diversity, but we also have diversity in, in backgrounds. We have people who has, uh, background in product management, in user experience, in the web developer, in the, any kind of fields of marketing. And this diversity, when you, that, that's the richness of our business. When you brainstorm and when you try to put 
products forward, you have all these different minds that come with different perspectives, and all of them works together to make things happen. So uh, coming out to the topic of my, my talk, <laughs> what I am planning to talk is uh, about artificial intelligence. I'm going to do a very brief intro to artificial intelligence. After that, I'm going to talk about what is the product life cycle when we talk about AI products? What is uh, similar and what is different from the regular software development life cycle? And finally, I'm going to talk about some conclusions and remarks. So let's start with AI. So artificial intelligence, right now, there's a big hype around artificial intelligence. And everybody wants to do artificial intelligence. And uh, in fact, there is a big, big, big amount of money invested on artificial intelligence. Canadian government last year invested more than $400 billion in artificial intelligence in order to help academic institutions and also organizations that can help the government to go forward and position Canada as a lead on the field. Uh, additional to that, the, the revenue that uh, is expected worldwide coming from artificial intelligence is going to be 3,000% higher in 2025 than now. So we're, we're talking that this is growing and growing a lot. But what is artificial intelligence? What you can do right now with artificial intelligence and what we would like to do with it? So the first thing is uh, artificial intelligence is, uh, is an area of computer science that is, uh, made the computers able to do tasks that usually humans are, are the ones who do that. And artificial intelligence is not a new thing. In fact, the, the, the term artificial intelligence was appointed in 1955, so we're talking, I don't know, 80 years ago, a, a lot, long time ago, and people have been working on that since then. What happened? What happened? Why now? Why, why there is a difference now? Well, the, the difference is uh, in order to be able to do artificial intelligence, you need two things. You are going to need data, and you are going to need computational power. And in the last years, storage, the, the storage has been very, very, become cheaper and cheaper. You can put things, I don't know, in Amazon, in AWS Cloud, or in Google Cloud, or even you can buy hard drives of terabytes and are very, very cheap. And also, at the same time, the computational power has grown a lot. So right now, you can make calculations on a GPU that makes the, 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 the calculation goes much, much faster than before. So when I started doing AI, I started doing AI in 2002. At the moment, if I have a neural network and the neural network had I don't know, few parameters, only one layer, I might need to wait one week for the thing to run to see a result. So that makes that when I'm going to be training and, and, and make that that thing learn something, and we're going to talk about learning and what that means, but what I, I want to give you a sense that, right, that each time I need to do that, I need to wait one week. Right now, I can do exactly the same thing, and it, it is going to run maybe in three minutes. So we, we, we really, really can do things right now. Before, it was impossible, because I, to run a project, I might need two years to, 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 to wait. <laughs> so um, there are, when we talk about AI, there are two big uh, group, uh, categories. What we call a strong or general AI, that is, for now, is like a hypothetical AI, when you really develop machines that, that can behave like humans, that they can learn by themselves, that can generalize the tasks that they have been training to do. Is, uh, there are groups that are actively researching that, and, uh, but right now, this is not a state of the art. Uh, this is, for now, is sci-fi. Uh, in the other hand, you have what we call weak or narrow AI. Weak or narrow AI is when you train the machine to do one particular task, or maybe a set of tasks, maybe two, three tasks. So there is a human that needs to be sit there, needs to be working for maybe two, three months, is going to teach the machine, and after that, the machine can do only that task. The machine cannot decide by himself, ah, oh, let me do a note by itself, do a, a different thing. 
So this is the kind of AI that we currently do, narrow AI. And what is exactly what we already mentioned, artificial intelligence. Now, inside, another term that I'm sure that everybody has read on the newspapers, on articles, everywhere, is machine learning. So machine learning is an area inside artificial intelligence where the machine can really learn from that. So instead of, when you have artificial intelligence, you can give rules to the machine. I can do artificial intelligence by giving rules. I say to the machine, okay, if this happened, do this, this, and this, and if not, do this, this, and that. When we talk about machine learning, I don't give the rules. What I give is a bunch of data, and I tell the machine, okay, machine, now you need to infer the pattern here. You need to learn. You need to find yourself what's going on there. Inside machine learning, there is, uh, an, okay, inside machine learning, there is a particular class of algorithms that are called deep learning. Deep learning are neural networks. We're not going to enter into that, that detail right now. But basically, neural networks are loosely based on the way that your brain works. You have these neurons that are connected, and you have these synapses between one neuron and the other. And depending on how this connection, how strong is that connection, the machine is going to be learning different things. So deep learning, what is important for us right now is that deep learning is part of machine learning, means that the machine is going to be inferring things. It's going to be, you don't need to tell anything to the machine. Now, machine learning has three different types of learning. One type of learning is supervised learning. Supervised learning is uh, when the machine learn from data that has annotations, data that you already know the answer. The, user, the, the, the person who is training the machine is telling the machine, OK, imagine you want to classify dogs and cats, OK? So I, I have a bunch of pictures of dogs and cats, and I'm going to throw that to the machine. And I'm going to tell the machine, I want you to learn what's a cat and what's a dog. Okay, imagine we're going to do that. So when we're doing that, you need to tell the machine, for the first, for our training data, the training data is the data that we're going to be using for the machine to learn. So you are going to need to tell the machine, OK, this is a dog, learn. Go through all the neurons, but this is a dog. Learn that. And after you send the other one, okay, this is the cat. The thing goes through all the neurons, OK, this is a cat. And in fact, the way the machine learn is this. You send the picture, and the picture is going through all the layers. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And it arrives to the end, and it says, oh, I think this is a dog. Uh, but you have the label. You have what the users say that it is. So imagine that was a cat. So the, the label said, no, this was a cat. You made a mistake. So the machine is telling to all the friends, all the neurons that were be before, oh, you made a mistake, you made a mistake, you made a mistake. And all these things are going to be adjusted, and now, we, the machine started learning, OK, I did a mistake. I don't like to make mistakes. So let me adjust this. So next time you pass the picture, I'm going to know. So when you do that with a lot of these pictures, and when I say pictures, really, this can be with text, with anything. When you do that with all these pictures or all these texts, the machine gets smart. And it starts learning the pattern. It starts, OK, each time I have a cat seems to be that has these characteristics. And it's time I have a dog has these other characteristics. When all this training is finished, what the machine gives us is a model. So the machine was able to model what is a cat and what is a dog. So next time I pass a picture through the, through the machine, even if I don't have the label, now the machine is going to know because the machine has the model. The machine knows the characteristics of a dog or a cat. The difference of this with what we were doing before programming is that before, if I want to do the same algorithm, I need to write a bunch of if statements. I, if it has, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to describe the difference between a dog and a cat, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so imagine I know. <laughs> no, no, because it's different. So, so how to differentiate the features between the dog and the cat and write that in a program is, is not trivial. So we say, oh, both has point ears, and maybe both, so it's, I, I don't know. 
But the, that me as a human, I know the difference. So if you show me a dog and a cat, for sure I know. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but so the same happened with the machine. So exactly the same happened. The, the, these neurons learn that pattern and now knows. OK, and so this is the supervised learning. Supervised learning has a pro, super, most of the algorithms that are deployed and in production right, right now come from supervised learning. It has a problem, is that you need a human to annotate all this data. So if I need to train my machine and I need 5,000 examples of dogs and 5,000 examples of cats, I need a human being annotating all this information. So annotating means put the label, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog. So, the ideal situation in life is that we can go unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is, now I pass my pictures of the dogs and the cats, I don't give the labels, but the machine learns that there are certain differences, can classify it, the machine realizes by himself, by itself, ah, you know, I'm passing this thing, I'm getting this, and all these things are similar here, and all these other things are similar here. The machine is not going to know the name of this is a dog or the name of this is a cat, but it's going to find a pattern. What happens is if I take the same example of dogs and cats, the machine is going to learn patterns, but we don't know based on which characteristics. So probably the machine is going to take all the small dogs and cats that are black and they are going to put that in a place. And all the, uh, that will be mixed dogs, dogs and cats. The machine is going to be able to separate them into classes but probably is not going to be able to separate very well by the features that we are interested in this case, but it, that is the type of animal. Nevertheless, unsupervised learning is very useful. For example, in marketing, it's, it's used for customer segmentation. In mind, you have a lot of customers, and traditionally what people from marketing do is that you take demographic information and you say, in mind, you have, you have an e-commerce store, and you want to send newsletters to your, to your clients. So traditionally, people from marketing say, OK, to all women between 17 and 23 years old, send lipstick in the newsletter. And for men between 45 and 63, send a tie. That, that's what, that's what uh, market, people from marketing do. So basically, take demographic information and decide. So one thing that is very good in unsupervised learning is I can take all these customers, I can take everything that they have bought or they have clicked, and I can try to clusterize them. It means that I can try to separate them into groups. Because it might be that there is a, a 45 years man that really likes the lipstick. And I was excluding him before. So the system is able to understand the user taste by clusterizing only by analyzing the data without any label. The third type of learning is called reinforcement learning. And, uh, and this, uh, this type of learning is really interesting. It's, uh, it's based on how, uh, how humans behave and learn. And uh, the, the way it works is you have, you have an agent, you have your computer, something that, an individual that wants to learn something. Imagine you want, uh, okay, you want the machine to learn to walk from here to there, okay? So, and you just tell the machine, okay, step, uh, to the agent, to the, to the individual that you have inside your computer. You need to walk from here to there, but you, I'm not going to give you the rules. I'm not going to give you how to arrive there, and I, I'm not going to tell you anything. So what will happen is that the machine tries to do things, and it's going to do this, and it's a bang, and it's not going to work. And after come here, and it's go, I'm not going to jump, but imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to jump there. And, so the machine is going to be, make a lot of mistakes. So each time the machine makes a mistake, we penalize the machine. And we tell the machine, hey, you have three points less. It's like when you play a video game. So at some point, the machine is going to learn that the best way to arrive uh, there is if I go in a straight line to that place. So the, this kind of reinforcement learning, the reinforcement is because you give a reward. When the machine arrives to that place with your agent, arrives to that place there, you are going to tell, okay, you want three points here. 
the machine is going to be happy, and next time it's going to try to do the same, uh, the same, the, the task in the same way. So this kind of learning is very use, useful for strategies and tactics. For example, I think that everybody probably has read that Google created this AlphaGo that was able to, to, to win against the, the Go game against the world champion. The way that that was trained was using this reinforcement learning. Uh, oh, no, I have this. Uh -huh. OK. So I'm going to give some examples of things that we can do uh, using uh, machine learning. Uh, all the examples I'm going to show are from things that uh, the team, uh, my team, the team that works with me is doing. So this is an example. This is an, this is an electrocardiogram, okay, from a patient. And uh, what we want to do is classify if there is uh, a arrhythmia in there, if there are heartbeats that are abnormal. So usually what happens is that the, um, the doctor needs to see this ECG and need to each one of these heartbeats that are in here, need to say, okay, this is normal, this is normal, ah, this one seems abnormal here. When you have this ECG here, probably is only 20 seconds, I don't know. So imagine you have, two weeks of ECG. Somebody is, is, is having a halter and, is, and wear it for two weeks. So now a human needs to spend maybe three, four hours in order to classify this. So the idea is that we create a system that automatically can classify the heartbeats. The way that the machine does that is that understand patterns. All these things that you have here are the annotations. So this is what they, because this is supervised learning. So basically, a human put an annotation here, and the machine is learning from that annotation to be able to classify in the future. Another, exa oh, yeah. Another example, this is, a, this is unsupervised learning, okay? So in this case, each one of these uh, pictures that you see here, okay, I put two zooms here, uh, are pieces of clothing. These are ties and these are shirts. So what we did is that we took a catalog of clothing and we told the machine, hey machine, take all these and try to find which ones are similar. So and the machine did all the calculation, used unsupervised learning. We didn't give any other information more than the pictures. And the machine found that all these pictures are similar and all these are similar and if I zoom in any given place, you are going to see that the machine is able to understand and find similarities, find patterns between things. So this is an example of pattern discovery and clusterization. This is another example. This is an example using um, reinforcement learning. And basically, this is a, a basketball game. I think it's basketball. And it, yes, it's basketball. <laughs> Backwards. Yeah, yes, it's backwards. <laughs> and, and basically, what you have here is the two teams, the green team and the red team, and we're trying to understand from the movement of the players if they are missing a good shot. For example, this guy here should have shot because he has 66% of probability of, uh, I don't know, you know, put this thing in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, this guy, this guy is a bad shot. So the machine is able, or for example, in this case, this guy that has a ball, the yellow is the ball. So the, this guy should have passed. He has only 9% of probability, even if he's very close. But he should have passed the ball to this guy or this guy to have more probability. So this, for example, is an example of the use of reinforcement learning uh, to uh, help coaches to train their teams and, and give better decisions. This is an example, by, uh, by the way, this example here is done by Mariam, who is there in the public. <laughs> this is uh, post-estimation. In, in this case, this is, a, this is not basketball, this is hockey. <laughs> How smart am I, no? <laughs> Okay, so and what she's doing is try to estimate, so basically this is a frame for a video, 
and the, the machine automatically ingests all the video and is able for each one of the players to know exactly where, where they are located and what is the position of their body in each one of the points. And this last slide I'm going to show for this part is, uh, is a topic that is very important and I think that was, uh, was mentioned today about uh, machine learning right now and, the, and in particular deep learning. It's about interpretability and transparency. So as I mentioned before, uh, I say, okay, I'm, going to, I, I'm not able to describe the, the, the dog and the cat. So when I pass all these things through the, through the machine, the machine is going to tell this is a dog, this is a cat. But the machine is not going to tell me why. It's only going to tell me this is a dog and this is a cat. And if I'm differentiating dog, dog and cat, that's not necessarily a, a big deal to know why. But if I, what I'm doing is deciding if you are going to get a, a, a mortgage or you're not going to get a mortgage, that says might be, import, might be important to know why this is happening. So when the decisions can affect people's lives, it's important to work towards the interpretability in machine learning. So there is an active field of research to remove this black box idea of the, of the neural network and try to give ideas of what, what, what are the reasons why this machine is giving this answer. So this is an example where, where, where basically this is like a heat map showing where the machine is, uh, is putting more attention when you look at these pictures. So in that way, if I then have a classification, this is a human, a dog, or a cat, I might know, okay, what the machine was really looking when was taking that decision was this, this, and this. Okay, so this was the, the first part that was a super brief introduction on artificial intelligence. And now uh, we're going to talk uh, about what means uh, have a, a product on AI. And I wanted to call this also a story about inclusion. And, and this is the reason. I, I started the talk saying that AI is incredible, is going to, there is a lot of investment on AI, millions and millions of dollars from governments, their revenue, worldwide revenue will be huge. So a lot of people want to do AI. And I think that we need everybody to be on the product, not only the data scientist, not only the, the researcher, not only the person who does the fundamental research. We need, we need project managers, we need user experience, we need front-end developers, and I want to show you why we need all these people working with us. So don't feel that because you don't do AI, you are not cool. That's not true. <laughs> no, no, it, it's true. I, I, I have gotten this feeling even, even People who work with me say, ah, but I'm not doing that. No, but you're doing super important things because you do nothing. If I do an algorithm and that algorithm does something, and now I don't know how to express that to my, to my end user. I cannot make this usable. I cannot make influence the person who at the end of the day is going to be taking decisions based on that. I'm doing nothing. So AI without everybody else doesn't work. So how is the, the project, like the project framework, how, how I think that, uh, and this is my, my personal point of view, but how I think that we should approach a project in AI. The first thing is when a client comes or we have an idea about a product, the first thing is we need to understand what are the questions that we want to answer. And that happened a lot, and that has been said even today in other talks, that people come and say, ah, oh, I want to add AI in my product, but I don't know even what is AI. No, you need to have a problem. It's not apply AI because you want. It's because you have a problem that can be solved through AI. The second thing that you need is data. You need to have, because most of the learning is this supervised learning, or even if it's unsupervised, you need also the data, not label, but you need data. So, the first phase is this exploration phase. In the exploration phase, what we need to do is explore, is to know, is this project feasible? Is the answer of your question in your data? Are we going to find this pattern that you are looking for? 
Um, you, you should not commit to do a project without being sure that this is feasible, that the information is in there. So this is a, a first phase that is an analysis phase. If you do some algorithms there with standard algorithms to see if things work fine. And you, you do data clean, a lot of this stuff. And if everything goes well here, you can come to the next step. The next step is when you are going to say, OK, this is feasible. So imagine it's the, the case of the ECG classification. OK? So we wanted to classify the different arrhythmia types. And we do the exploration, and we find, yes, it is possible. It seems that with the standard algorithms, we're, we're getting 60% accuracy. Means that 60% of the time, we are classifying the thing the right way. At the exploration phase, the researcher who is working on that is going to say, ah, you know, but there is this, 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 and this algorithm that I haven't tried. And I think that this, this can make things better. So this is the applied research. It's an iterative uh, phase. It's a phase where we are improving, we're, we're, we're improving the models, we're changing the neural network, we're training the system. Maybe we need to find more data. I don't know. But this, this phase comes here. When our client or, our, or, or us, if, if, we are, if, it's, if, if it is our own product, where we feel enough satisfied, at that point, with that research, we need to come to the software development phase. In the software development phase, we need to start talking about, OK, what is going to be the UX? What, what's going to be the experience of my final user? How I'm going to transmit that, this information so it is usable and accessible for everybody? And the, the, the last phase is that we need, the system needs to be ongoing learning and improvement. For example, in the in my, I'm doing the ECG classification, so each time, so the, the same way we deploy the system, we do the software, we have an interface. So the, each time they have new and new patients, that data of that patient need to enter into the system too to help the system to get better. At the same time, they should be a verification points and maybe humans or, the, or, or machine verification points that can say that with the new data, we still have an accurate result. So I'm going to give a, a use case uh, in, in order to, to finish my talk. So this use case is, uh, we're going to use this case cyberbullying detection. This, in fact, uh, is a project that uh, where Veronica, I don't know where's Veronica. Veronica, she is shy, but is there. She was working on that. <laughs> OK, so what's the, what's the idea? The idea is that imagine you are in a, in a chat, in a forum, and you want a system that automatically detect bully, bullying. You want to know, OK, uh, is this comment in here somebody bullying somebody, or is only sarcasm? Is a friend that is being like uh, colloquial in, in, the, in their talk, and is that why he's insulting the other? You don't know. So you need to detect in each one of these rows if each one of these comments or pictures are offensive in any way for the user. So we start by our data scientists, OK? So these data scientists, <laughs> that's Veronica. <laughs> OK, so these data scientists, she the, uh, she arrives and says, OK, I'm going to solve this problem. So the first thing is, OK, I'm going to take some data, and I'm going to try to analyze it. And she starts, oh my god, but there are so many different definitions of cyberbullying. And I'm not very sure what is cyberbullying and what is not cyberbullying. So she needs help. So she says, oh, how do I define cyberbullying? What important features I should model? So as she needs help, we call our business analyst. Business analyst is somebody who knows about this chat, OK? And he is going to say, ah, OK, cyberbullying. To, in order to be cyberbullying, the behavior needs to be repeated. And in order to be cyberbullying, I don't know, the guys cannot be friends or whatever definition this business analyst finds that is appropriate for the particular case. But he say, ah, but I need some label data here. Label data because we're going to do a classification system and we need 
this data. So he called his next friend, that is the data notator. That, by the way, Emily is there. She's our data notator. Emily, you are this one. <laughs> so now the data notator is going to take a lot of content that finds in the internet or in our chat system that we are working, and it's going to be marking each one of the messages in each one of the conversations as this is, this is cyberbullying or this is not cyberbullying. Or even more, is it because in the definition that the business analyst, the business analyst says, okay, cyberbullying can be hate or can be sexual harassment, harassment or can be, I don't know, other kind of aggression. So she's going to be able to annotate this case. So she's annotating this, and she realized that, oh my god, this is too hard to annotate because I need to be downloading the data, put that in an Excel file. It's really, it's really something I cannot do. So we have, ah, where, there is, where is the other guy? Where, <laughs> ah, here. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh my god, my team has disappeared. OK. So, so she decided, oh, I'm going to call our other friend, that is our user experience guy, because he's going to be able to provide her with the right, with, with the right tool to annotate in an effective way. But even more, that tool can be used after for the community manager of this particular chat to be supervising the, the, the job of the, of the system. So let me go over here. So at this point that we, are, we have the annotated data, our data scientists start working on this. And what kind of job does this data scientist? OK, the first thing does text preprocessing. Because we realize that this problem is more complex than what we saw. When, especially when, when people write in chats, half of the words are not English, or whatever other thing you can imagine. You have mixes between acronyms, like LOL, a, any kind of abbreviations, emojis that goes in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> words, yes, words that have like, uh, now it's LOL but with 10 O's. You have LOL. And you have all this, so if you need to teach them, because what, what, what you're going to do is you're going to need to teach the machine to understand English, and after the machine understands English, say this is bullying or not. But if people is not writing English, the machine cannot understand. So the first step is, Preprocessing. Try to see how we can convert all these things into English. Okay. After that, it comes the next step that is very common in the natural language processing. Words are difficult. Words are something that humans we understand. You understand the meaning of word. If I say hello, you 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 mean you, you understand that I'm I'm saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the machine is not. That is smart. The machine doesn't understand words. So there is a technique, something called word embedding, that converts words into numbers, really into vectors, but into numbers. And the machine, the machine are very good at work with numbers. So what happened is that imagine, imagine all these screen are words. So the, the words that are more similar one with each other are going to be closer. So we'll have numbers that are similar. So the word five and the word 10, no, and the word six are almost the same word. So the machine is starting in understanding relationship with, between words. So the next step that need to be do, doing, done by our data scientists is convert these words in something that the machine can handle. And it's pretty cool. In, in, when you do word embedding, the machine gets so good that you can do like arithmetic operations with words. So you can do things like you, you have a king, you say king minus man plus woman, and this is going to be equal, it's going to say queen. So if you remove the gender part from the king and you add the woman to get the king, you get the, the, the queen. So the machine gets really smart at, at, at working with words. Next step, the, the data scientist is going to use some kind of neural network in order to try to classify. It's going to do classification, like a dogs and cat classification, but with each one of the sentences. This is not going to be enough because you have a long conversation. And in that conversation, you need to understand the context. So you are going to need to add also some kind of classification at the conversation level. And even when you do this at the conversation level to understand, ah, but the person before say this, 
or, or imagine you insult the other, but the other, guy, the other person laughs, you say, okay, no, this was a joke. Well, so you need to understand the context. So the next step is going to that. Uh, after we can add context, we can add information about the user profile. We can say, okay, these two persons were very close friends. They have been talking for six years. So maybe really this is not bullying, okay? So you need to add all this intelligence into it, and after you always iterate and improve. So coming back to our inclusive team, when we add our UI UX person, this person here say, okay, as we need to communicate with our users, I'm going to need my product owner or project manager, depends on how is your structure, and this person here, is going to say, okay, let me talk with, with, with the users, with the people who is going to be using this interface. Let me understand what are their needs. Let me write these requirements. So as you see, the, the, the person who does AI did something, but really who is making this happen is all this team, because after this product owner goes this way, you need the front-end developer to develop, you need the back-end developer to make sure that this is scalable, that this is robust, and for sure you need your QA person to make sure that what we're doing is right. So AI projects are projects about inclusion and not only projects about AI. So this is an example of an interface, for example, that we will have done. In the interface you have each one of the comments and you have the machine mark automatically if this is cyberbullying, but the annotator can change this, and also you have a drop down to say what kind of cyberbullying it is. That's a very simple interface that you could do. Okay, so the final, the final slide uh, for this section is how is our full cycle? So our full cycle, after we have all this thing working together, and we have all this happening, when this goes to production, you always need to have, you pre-process the data, you train your model, you do your real-time processing of whatever is happening in the chat, you automatically flag the comments, ah, and this is something that, for example, our product owner discovered. Our product owner discovered that the community manager, the person who was going to uh, manage all this chat, didn't feel super well at flag everything automatically with AI. So we needed to add also a confidence level. And we needed to say, okay, when the, 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 the community manager can move that, that threshold and can say, okay, I only want automatic flagging when you are 80% sure, and the rest is going to be me. But we leave that, uh, that power to the community manager. So give to the final user power on top of the AI is important. It's important you make your, your user feel that he can trust the system. And, well, and, 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 and finally, after the real try processing, you always verify the results, you correct, and you improve, improve in your cycle. So now the, the last part are conclusions and remarks. That is going to be very short. Uh, well, the first one, is, this is a, a quote from Andrew N.G. He is, uh, I, I don't know exactly his title, but he's like the head of AI at the Baidu. He also was professor at the Stanford. He has a lot of AI courses in Coursera. I think that he's co-founder of Coursera too. And he says, use as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago. Today, I actually have a hard time thinking of an industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. So AI is probably going to be changing the way we see the world. But it's in our hands, in the hands of the tech people, the people, the tech makers that are here, in order to decide how we want AI to transform the world, how we want this experience to go to our final users, how transparent, inclusive, inclu inclusive uh, and interpretable is going to be this AI. And my second uh, conclusion is that we should embrace diversity, we should embrace inclusion, not because it's on rights, it's not, not because, yes, yeah, this is the right thing to do in this forum, but it's because this is the smart way to going forward. And finally, this is the, the woman on my team. Yes, and, <laughs> and as we are inclusive, this is men and women too. 
Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? So I know that Quebec started a conversation around the ethics of yes. inter artificial intelligence. Uh, if you could provide an update regarding this discussion and also uh, why are we sometimes worried about AI? Okay. So. Um, Last year in November, I think it was November, there was a forum called uh, Montreal AI Responsible or something like that. And we, the people who participated in the forum, we brought like a manifest where we point uh, the risks of, of AI, the benefits, and we're trying to find ways for governments and lawmakers to be aware of it and try to to take uh, action. So it's everything about democracy, autonomy, transparency. Uh, I, I don't have here the URL because that's not on my computer, but uh, I, I can share the URL of that uh, manifest. There will be certain, there is also, by the way, an AI ethics meetup that happens each two weeks. Uh, it's very, very, very good. I, I try to go every time I can. And in that meetup, we also discuss here in Montreal uh, about what is our participation, what we can do to make sure that things do doesn't go out of our hands. Um, for, the, for the AI Responsible Manifest, right now is um, it's in a stage where they are being going to different coffee shops in Montreal to talk with people, with talk with citizens about what they think, gather that information, and in October or November this year, there will be like a final version of the manifest where not only the, there is the opinion from the experts, but also from citizens that wants to, to express their concerns. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.